Hello and welcome to Father Spitzer's Universe at the intersection of faith and reason. I'm Doug Keck, your uh, traffic uh, cop, and your host coming to you from our EW10 studios in the heart of Mother Angelica's Birmingham, Alabama, Irondale. This is the mothership. This is where Mother started it all and where we anchor everything we do here at EWTN. And this program doesn't work without your questions. Email us those questions at spitzersuniverse at EW10.com. Post your questions on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash EW10online. The hashtag is FSUniverse. FS is for Father Spitzer. And also we've got a Twitter, and you can do that. You can tweet us at twitter.com forward slash EW10 hashtag. Again, FS Universe. And don't forget the Magis Center website. That's the place where you can find out everything about Father Spitzer, what he's doing, and information. Magis Center, one word, dot com. And before we get out to Father Spitzer, once again, wanted to mention the wonderful book that we just republished a latest new edition first time ever in soft cover mother angelica's answers not promises a wonderful work of her featuring straightforward solutions to life's puzzling problems with a new forward all new by father joseph mary wolf and uh, a wonderful way to uh, engage with the thought of mother angelica including topics like ways to overcome the difficulty in believing in god and probably also in believing in miracles, which happens to be our topic today as we once again join our host, Father Robert Spitzer, out on the West Coast at our Christ Cathedral Studios in Orange County, California. Welcome. Great to see you again, Father, here in this uh, week of July 4th. It's great to be back with you, Doug. Great to be with you. So anyway, we're going to be talking about the evidence of God's existence and talking about the miracles of Jesus then and now. So let me ask you a question. I understand the mm -hmm. idea of the miracles of Jesus then. What do you mean when you came up with this topic about the miracles of Jesus now? Are you saying Jesus is still performing miracles today? Absolutely. And of course, uh, we know that Jesus gave his apostles the power to perform miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit um, in his name. So it's in the name of Jesus. And of course, uh, we also believe that, uh, you know, Jesus can work miracles through the intercession of his mother and for pers from the, the, through the intercession of saints and prospective saints. In fact, that's one of the ways in which uh, uh, a saint, as it were, becomes canonized is through uh, the working of these many miracles. So yes, uh, indeed, Jesus uh, definitely uh, can uh, um, the name of Jesus is still a very powerful thing, and the power of Jesus in, in the Holy Spirit, very powerful, uh, you know, uh, agency of, of healing and, mm. and of miracles uh, to this very day. Well, it's interesting, too, and I know one of the things we've talked about, the existence of God and, and the whole secular world, the atheists out there, you know, some of the mm -hmm. material you think in terms of the miracles today, sometimes they're seen as something that might have existed in the past, they don't exist anymore theologically, or they were misunderstandings, like some of the people we've heard before, like uh, Spinoza. Mm -hmm. uh, Spinoza taught that the term miracle should yeah. be understood with reference to the opinions of men, that it means simply an event which was unable to be explained by other events familiar to our experience, because they were all about experience, right? Uh, including people like Locke right. and Kant, and we hear that. Is that a reason why we seem to have such a skeptical age when it comes to miracles today? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, there, there, there was, you know, a, a whole lead in uh, to this kind of skepticism, um, you know, that part of it has to do with uh, an overreaction to uh, the beautiful natural sciences, right? Natural sciences, you know, taken to their ends, uh, you know, can be the way of validating a miracle. Uh, and, and but there is a, a movement called scientism, which tries to restrict all reality to observable empirical physical reality. Now <clears throat> that, of course, is, as I've described before, uh, is self-refutational because you know the minute you make the statement, all reality must be observable. You can't prove that statement by means of observational evidence because, of course, uh, you would have to know what you don't know uh, in, in order to show that everything is is observational. And if there is something outside of observation and everything is reduced 
irreducible to observation, you wouldn't know it. So it's a completely self-refuting statement. Mm -hmm. Now, that scientism is what kind of got off the ground. But there are antecedents to scientism. And one of them is Spinoza, who was very much a determinist. So he resolved ahead of time, look, if something looks like a miracle, it's just that we don't know the natural cause that caused it. Now, nobody really believes in Spinozistic determinism at all anymore. Mm -hmm. And certainly nobody believes that the world is, is, uh, operates according to completely deterministic law, uh, or laws, scientific laws. Now, that was thought in Spinoza's days because that was a pre-quantum physics time. Mm -hmm. So, right, there's, you know, essentially there is no sense of quantum physics, right? Everybody thinks the, the, the scientific laws are deterministic. Kant thought that. Hume thought that. Nobody believes that today. Nobody believes in complete determinism today. In fact, you know, the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg, which is the basis for a whole area of quantum physics, is alternatively called the principle of indeterminacy, right? You, you, there's indeterminacy built into the universe itself. So all of Hume's arguments, mm -hmm. all of uh, Spinoza's arguments, and even the implied Kantian arguments uh, against uh, miracles on the basis of, of scientifically deterministic uh, laws of nature are completely thrown out the window. I mean, nobody believes this anymore. Mm -hmm. Not even strict naturalists believe this anymore because, of course, quantum theory completely disproves it. So anyway, but it's, it's there and, and still this kind of view persists. There are a lot of scientists out there who prefer to remain naturalistic and even, you know, uh, we'll talk a little later on in the program about a, a, a Alexis Carroll who was a Nobel uh, Prize winner and but he was very much an agnostic who didn't want to believe in, in miracles but at the, in the end he, he couldn't deny it. Right. He, he was just confronted with it uh, right up to his uh, neck as as it were. Mm -hmm. But the, the main thing is there are a lot of people who still hold that a, as a natural prejudice, uh, but I would say that there is such ample evidence based on good scientific analysis, medical analysis of physical causation that shows that there are some kinds of transphysical causes at work that are not reducible to merely inexplicable or unknown natural causes, but real transphysical causes. And that, of course, we can talk about some of those modern miracles that have been uh, tested out, and we can certainly right. already uh, also talk about uh, some of the ancient miracles, uh, like raisings from the dead, uh, that, that just cannot be accounted for in any natural terms. And we've been talking about that, too, by the way, in the Shroud of Turin, right, exactly. when we talked about, you right. know, how does a, a, a dead body uh, uh, produce several billion watts of vacuum ultraviolet radiation for one forty billionth of a second to produce a completely unique and perfectly three-dimensional negative photographic image, you know, in one forty billionth of a second. You tell me, you know, how you're going to explain that with unknown natural causes not. Right. It's not going to happen. Okay. So, for all intents and purposes, I do think there is reasonable and responsible evidence for miracles today, and certainly ultimate scientific justification for it in the principle of indeterminacy, which is intrinsic to quantum theory. Okay, let's pick that up right from there. Question we got in on an email. Uh, mm -hmm. Father Spitzer, have any modern day miracles been brought to the attention during scientific debate on whether or not God exists? How would an atheist who works in the field of science, what you were talking about just before, respond to revelations of miracles? What are your experiences with this, Father? Please share. Devin from Idaho. So you talked about this. You've yeah. talked about some people have been infected by this, I guess, or impacted by this. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of scientists who are personally impacted by it, but they generally don't use miracles as a proof of God. Uh, I'm not sure why. 
people don't use near-death experiences as a proof of God. I do not know why. I, I think there's kind of an aversion to it in the scientific community. Right now, where the arguments in the scientific uh, debate are taking place are in, in four major areas that are more uh, global scientific theories. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I mean, the, the Big Bang Theory is universally believed. Given that, as I've talked about before, the Board of Lincoln and Guth proof is a big area which produces a lot of scientific debate about God. If you believe that the Board of Lincoln and Guth proof, which shows the beginning of any expanding universe or multiverse or string universe, then if you interpret that as being a beginning of physical reality, you're implying a creator. The same thing with entropy. The evidence of entropy is not only the evidence for a beginning of our universe, but could be the beginning of any physical system which likewise would imply a creator. And then you have uh, what, what's called uh, you know, a variety of, of different arguments on the basis of anthropic coincidences. This is fine tuning at the Big Bang in the universe. That can be interpreted as evidence for creation. And that's, these are where the basic you know, debates are taking place. But alas, in answer to, uh, your, um, to the uh, question, um, uh, the, um, it's not taking place along the lines of miracles, although I think it should. I think it should take place along the lines of near-death experiences. I think this is really an important area uh, that is accessible to observational evidence. And so these are the things that, that should be done, but they, they're just not mm -hmm. done. There seems to be an aversion uh, to putting the debate in that area. But nevertheless, uh, you know, miracles are certainly, uh, you know, a place to start if you want evidence of transphysical power in the natural world, uh, which is done through the name of Jesus. There is at least a, a reasonable and responsible implication of Jesus's divinity and his continued power manifest through the Holy Spirit in the world. The same thing with near-death experiences. There is reasonable and responsible belief that your transphysical soul not only will survive bodily death, but will also uh, approach a loving light, white light or deceased relatives and friends or Jesus himself uh, in, in, a, in a state of a, called paradise, an otherworldly domain. So these are things that are very valid clues as well. But yeah, they, they really don't enter into the scientific debate as your as your uh, as the questioner uh, asked. Okay, here's here's a question. Uh, I was reading an article uh, in preparation for the particular program that we're doing on miracles, and this person points out in this mm -hmm. article it's significant that the Bible appeals constantly to what they call the reign of law in nature, while it attests to the actual occurrences of miracles. So the question is, is that a contradiction, or, or in a sense we're going to say well, like the natural law, the reign of law, and that's why things work the way God set it up, but yet we are okay with going outside of the natural law. How do we justify that position? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reign of law in, in nature, that does not mean anything like what we mean by physical causation and natural laws in the scientific sense. In, in the biblical world view, um, Jesus is, you know, intimates, you know, that God is very active in the world continuously. And this is the belief also in the Old Testament is that God is causing things to happen. Now, Jesus doesn't say that God is doing this, but he says, for example, God causes his sun to, to shine or arise on, you know, the, uh, on the evil as well as the good. And he causes his reign to fall on uh, the uh, unrighteous, I mean, uh, on the righteous as well as the unrighteous. Now, you know, he does, so there that idea of divine causation in nature is very much a part of the way the biblical scriptures uh, viewed nature. They, and, and so having God perform a miracle was, you know, God's, you know, special intervention uh, in the natural world, but was, you know, but was not, there, there was not this idea of deterministic physical laws. That starts to change uh, with Aristotle and Aristotle's works coming up into Europe. And when this happens, it's saying, St. Thomas Aquinas himself, who forms these laws of secondary causation, 
from the works of Aristotle, which in turn, our own St. Thomas, is the one who paves the way for the idea of natural laws, you know, that can operate independently of divine causation at, at all times. Of course, God is, mm -hmm. is creating the, these laws to make them, but he's not making the laws operate, that they have a secondary causation, they have an efficacy independently of the divine power because of uh, that's the way God willed it and wanted it to have these secondary causes. So it's actually St. Thomas Aquinas who gets this off the ground, paves the way for the natural sciences, and then of course we see later, uh, you know, the, the natural scientific community runs with it. So um, no, there's no contradiction mm -hmm. in the scriptures. And by the way, there's no contradiction in the modern worldview either, because uh, physical laws today are not viewed as uh, deterministic. Right. So um, that's, uh, that's the answer basically. Okay, very good. We're going to take a break on that point. We'll be back with more with Father Spitzer as we talk about our topic today, the miracles of Jesus then and now. Much more ahead. Stay with us here on Father Spitzer's Universe. And thank you so much once again for staying with us here in Father Spitzer's universe. We're talking about the topic of miracles. And uh, as we join Father once more, let me ask you this question, Father. Just thinking about the word miracle mm -hmm. and the, the Latin meaning of it, to wonder. Okay, somebody sees mm -hmm. a miracle and says, mm -hmm. well, I wonder. But I mean, does that mean that, there's, that we can't be sure that it's really the work of Jesus or of God? If it means to wonder, what's your take? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I think it, it, the whole idea is it causes wonder and awe. And so it's, it's a slightly different thing. It's, it's not so much, you know, that it causes me to question, but wonder has a, another meaning. And, and it, it's like being awed by something. I, you know, I mean, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's awe-inspiring. And of course, it, it does cause mm -hmm. awe. It does cause uh, wonder in that sense that points to God. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament and New Testament uh, words for God are deed of power. So sometimes, uh, you know, uh, what you see is, is it's God's power, and this is a deed of power. It's a manifestation of God's power. Mm -hmm. So these are uh, two okay. uh, terms that are used, but the Latin is definitely causes awe, it causes wonder. Now, the other thing is that uh, just before I <clears throat> ask you some questions about the uh, some of the newer miracles, et cetera, out there. The topic of this is, mm -hmm. is again, miracles of Jesus then and now. Well, why are they considered mm -hmm. j miracles of Jesus when we say that? I understand when our Lord did it, you saw him do it. Why on the, let's say, no. Pentecost, wasn't that, was that a miracle of the Holy Spirit? And today, uh, why no. isn't it the Holy Spirit who gets credit for a miracle as opposed to Jesus? Or is that, uh, am I splitting hairs? Uh, well, I, I would say this. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that has been given to the apostles, and the Holy Spirit is uh, the, the dunamis to theu, right? The power of God himself. So uh, essentially, <clears throat> he is the power behind the miracle, but the miracle is performed in Christianity in the name of Jesus. And, and even if that, uh, for example, it's done through the intercession of Mary, it's still done through the name of Jesus. That is to say, the essence and the authority of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so the Holy Spirit is working through the authority of Jesus to perform this deed of power through a particular apostle or today through a particular, uh, you know, saint mm -hmm. or a particular person. So um, uh, the idea is, yes, it, it, it's the authority of Jesus. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit uh, that, that causes uh, the miracle to work. Okay, very good. Uh, next up, an email, Father. It seems like Jesus performed yeah. so many miracles during the times of the early church, which we see in the Bible and scripture, mm -hmm. but now we never hear about current miracles, at least not so much. Aren't Christ's miracles still alive and mm -hmm. kicking today? I think you believe so. Please discuss, and this is Marianne oh. from Tampa. 
Yeah, well, Marianne, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so we now today uh, have uh, the capacity to actually validate um, uh, these miracles. And, and so, of course, um, uh, the validation of the miracles uh, through a scientific or medical means are, are really remarkable. L let me give you a, uh, a uh, uh, you know, one example. Uh, St. John Paul II. Uh, so we have a whole medical team, seven medical experts, that validates this miracle that takes place in the 1990s to a, a woman named Flory Beth Mora. Uh, you know, she has a brain aneurysm and she is instantly cured of the brain aneurysm and, and of course there's you know this team just has to conclude at the end there is no physical cause to explain this I mean again the the one with Fulton J Sheen the miracle that happened in 2010 with the Engstrom family right where uh, you know this boy is he's born as a stillborn and is stillborn without a heartbeat for one hour after after he's born and then on top of this the his heart starts beating one hour after his birth at, when they start praying through the intercession of Fulton J Sheen and of course the, the again the scientific board of seven uh, scientific and medical consultants just concludes I, I, this is it can't be explained in terms of a physical cause again we see with uh, Pope Paul uh, the sixth the miracle behind uh, one of the miracles behind his canonization Right, or uh, future canonization is is that he is literally there's a child in utero who has substantial brain damage. Right, they pray through the inter the parents pray through the intercession of of, of uh, Paul the sixth, and and this child uh, literally not only comes out uh, you know perfectly uh, sound without any brain damage, but today he's alive, functioning perfectly as a normal. Per how does this happen? Right, I mean it just uh, uh, in. Explicable in terms of physical terms. Uh, again, you know there uh, there is a, a the, the the 69th uh, uh, validated miracle of Lourdes. Of course, there have been thousands of miracles that have taken place in Lourdes, but there's a whole process set up by the Lourdes Medical Commission to examine these again with a committee of doctors and scientists who are seeking any known physical explanation for this miracle. Well, anyway, the 69th uh, validated one by the Lourdes Medical Commission just got approved and, and essentially it was I believe a, a woman named Castellano or Castellino uh, she had uh, basically had several surgeries for tumors she was going to go back for her fourth surgery uh, for another tumor and and of course you know kind of the end of the row instead she decides to go to Lourdes instead of to the surgery she comes out of Lourdes and, and of course there's absolutely no manifestation of, of, of the tumor contrary to all the x-rays country uh, to, to all the other I mean no known physical cause so that just got uh, approved very recently we you know the Alexis Carroll uh, miracle is is really a, a, a terrific one uh, now that goes all the way back to 1902 in the very beginning of the Lourdes Medical Commission but Alexis Carroll is a, a doctor who had won a Nobel Prize and not only that this is the guy who discovered the heart pump right this is the guy who discovered how to suture uh, blood vessels mm -hmm. right this, this is a guy who, who had you know kept you know living tissue alive so that it, you know uh, alive that that it could it could be utilized and and and, and replaced you know in, in a body I mean this a you know, very bright creative guy and a convinced as I could lo love to say the irony of it a convinced agnostic and, and this fellow uh, literally is on a train somebody convinces him to help take some medical patients from Paris to Lourdes so he gets talked into it. He mm -hmm. goes on the train and he meets this woman who's on the train who's literally in the process of dying, Marie uh, Bailey. And uh, sh so she's on this train. She has a completely distended abdomen, right? She's got lumps in the abdomen. She has all the tubercular, uh, you know, signs of, of lung infection, right? She's obviously an advanced case of uh, 
tubercular, uh, tu tubercular peritonitis. And, and of course, she's on the train with, uh, with Alexis Carroll, and he, is, he just gives her morphine because she's in the process of dying. And, you know, he looks at her and goes, wow, you know, this person is, is going to die, you know, you know when, right when she gets to Lourdes. So, of course, he doesn't, uh, you know, connect with her. You know, she goes to Lourdes. She's bathed in the waters three times. She loses completely the abdominal distension. She loses all the effects of the tuberculosis in her lungs. She literally walks back onto the train from Lourdes under her own power. And Alexis Carroll is looking at this and going, no way. No possible way. So, of course, now he's stuck. So, of course, he doesn't want to admit, you know, that there's not some possible explanation. So he kind of holds on for a while. But then eventually, uh, you know, he s witnesses another miracle of an 18-month-old boy who's blind from birth who receives his sight instantaneously. And that mm -hmm. did it. He couldn't resist any longer. He finally just says, no, there is a transphysical cause here. There's a God here. It's related to Lourdes. Mm -hmm. It's related to the mother of our Lord. And, and for all intents and purposes, he becomes a Catholic, writes a book called The Voyage to Lourdes, uh, which, of course, is translated. But, I mean, these are the kinds of things that are happening. And modern Eucharistic miracles as well. I mean, that one with Pope Francis, I mean, in Buenos Aires, I think it was around 1996 or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a complete baffler. Mm -hmm. I mean, how are you going to explain this one? I mean, here you've got Pope Francis, uh, who, well, for, he He's not involved in it. It was actually uh, a priest by the name of Father Alejandro Pezet. Mm -hmm. and, and he's in a church one day, and, and of course, a, a lady informs him that a, a host, one of, uh, you know, a Eucharistic host, consecrated Eucharistic host, had been discarded and left in a candle holder. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, he, he, you know, the way of disposing this is, is to put it into a glass of water until, uh, until it dissolves. And so he takes the host, he puts it in a glass of water, and puts it in the tabernacle, fully expecting that in a couple of days it'll be completely dissolved. Comes back, it's not dissolved. In fact, it seems to be transforming. And of course, it winds up that after a month, this thing, instead of dissolving, has turned into a, a piece of flesh. Wow. And of course, so the guy goes and he takes pictures of this and he sends it to, at that time, Archbishop uh, 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 Bergoglio, who, you know, who's about to become Pope Francis. And, and of course, Bergoglio says, okay, take these pictures and, and you know, we're going to, uh, uh, you know, verify that, 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 that this has happened. So he takes the pictures. Then they actually take the flesh. So, so they keep it in the tabernacle. Forget this. Three years mm -hmm. they keep it in the tabernacle, right? And then they take it out of the tabernacle, nothing but distilled water to preserve it in, and they send this sample to a world-famous cardiologist in New York, and they don't tell him what it's about. They mm -hmm. just say, could you please test this sample? Tell us what it is. You know, they didn't know it came from the heart, uh, you know, and so forth. The guy comes back and says, well, this, it's definitively a piece of flesh or piece of tissue mm -hmm. that has come from the heart, from the left ventricle precisely, mm -hmm. with blood type AB. And, and then it, it, here's the bizarre part. It says that the white, uh, white cell count in this is exceedingly high, and the only way in which those white cells could exist in the heart at that time mm -hmm. uh, was if the heart had been alive when the tissue uh, sample was removed. Wow. In other words, okay. this was a live piece of heart tissue mm -hmm. that was in there, and the white cell count uh, definitively proves this. When he was told that it came from a host that had been in distilled water for three years, I think it just knocked him. Now, I don't know what the, the history of that mm -hmm. physician was, but I, I heard a, a story that maybe he, he had uh, uh, found a faith that he had not had before, but I haven't verified mm -hmm. that. But the one, uh, it, it certainly would have 
have verified my faith. I mean, right there you have a Eucharistic miracle in which Pope Francis right. is involved, which has some remarkable scientific evidence attached to it. So I'd say, you know, we're living in a great period, um, you know, where uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, we can get verification of these and many, many, many more miracles with good scientific and medical attestation mm -hmm. as to the absence of a natural cause implying a transphysical or metaphysical right. or divine or supernatural cause. Let me ask so you, it's Paul. Pretty neat. Let me pretty let me ask deal. you about that because yeah. that, that I, I'm not familiar with that. Obviously, the late great Bob and Penny Lord yeah. did a, a whole series of mm -hmm. uh, books related to Eucharistic miracles, a couple of them, and, and some series yeah. on that. And it's always been very powerful, and I know yeah. many people have said, gee, how come we don't hear more about this? And this particular miracle like this, I can't say that outside of what you've spoken about today, that I knew that much about it at all. Is there a reticence, do you think, sometimes inside the church uh, to promote these things? Uh, are there people out there who are almost mm -hmm. a little embarrassed of these things? or? or afraid that they'll turn out not to be mm -hmm. true? Is that the impact of secularism and scientism on the church? Or on people in the church? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, exactly, and, and as a matter of fact, I'd, I'd have to say that, um, you know, um, uh, there are, first of all, there are people who are, are a little bit ashamed of them, and, and, and you know, they don't want to be kind of snickered at by the natural world. Uh, also, there are people there who are worried about fraud, you know, that somebody could perpetrate a, a fraud, like the one, I think, in Salt Lake City, uh, you know, where there was apparently, uh, you know, a Eucharistic host with blood, but it turned out not to be the case. So they're worried about that. But if you want, though, this one, this is uh, all you have to do is put da, uh, Father Alejandro Alejandro Pezet, P E Z E T, mm -hmm. 1996 Buenos Aires Pope uh, Francis Eucharistic Miracle. It's going to come up okay. in about 50 different places on your Google. And boy, I'll tell you, you know, the fact that this had to be living heart tissue that was extracted, mm -hmm. you know, from a live a heart, you know, in order to get it there by natural means, instead of by, of course, the host dissolving mm -hmm. into it, that's starting to get into pretty reasonable and responsible evidence that, you know, something's mm -hmm. going on here, unless you're going to say that Father Pizet actually t uh, went around and, and, and killed a person right. to take a piece of live heart tissue to go ahead and manufacture this deal and put it in his tabernacle right. next to the... Eucharistic presence of Jesus, not, right. you know, I mean, if, 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 if that just seems beyond the pale. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you got a really good one here. It reminds yeah. me kind of what uh, you sorry. said in, in last week's show you talked about with St. Paul, the whole idea is what's the upside for us to do this, really? I mean, you know, here we are, we're going to set yeah. ourselves up for ridicule and things like that in the modern world. It's not like somehow yeah. that this is, there's such an upside. Let me ask you this question. Yeah. We've got a couple of minutes till we sure. got to take our next break. Uh, it seems like what I've heard sometimes in, in, in different parts of Christianity, there seems to be this sense that, well, kind of the miracle age and things sort of ended with the close of Scripture and the, the New Testament, and those kind of things ceased. And you'll get some who'll say, well, I might believe in a miracle, but it would have to be, how come I don't see somebody grow an arm who doesn't have one, or a foot who doesn't have one? Why is it always these things that, you know, uh, you can't see as clearly? Why isn't it something so obvious? What do you say to somebody like that? Yeah. Well, you know, first of all, uh, boy, the age of miracles certainly uh, uh, didn't stop um, with the, the New Testament, obviously. I mean, uh, it continues today, and the church is extremely careful about the miracles it accepts. We have a, a, a scientific commission uh, of seven doctors and scientists that normally will examine any miracle, especially one that's going to be used for the canonization of somebody like Fulton J. Sheen or or, you know, uh, you have the Lourdes Medical Commission, which is certainly more than seven uh, doctors and scientists, right, who are examining these things, and, and they're very careful about what they validate and, and accept. And, and so I would have to say that, that, you know, yes, people, I haven't heard too much of people growing an arm or something of that nature where kind of a, a you have a, almost a miraculous production of a new arm. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I, I mean, the reversal of cancer, you 
you know, in, in certain cases, or like uh, in the case of Alexis Carroll, where you have a complete and instantaneous reversal of tubercular peritonitis, which is going to result in death like any hour now, and, and the, the mm -hmm. woman is going back under her own power onto the train. Uh, you know, these things are spectacular. I mean, I mean, they're, 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 you know, there's no realistic way of explaining it. And there are so many examples of blindness. This is of particular importance to me, you know, where you have literally people who are blind from birth, who are healed from uh, their blindness. And, and this is a very typical kind of miracle that happens uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, happens also at Lourdes. In fact, it was the second one uh, that, that Alexis Carroll himself witnessed. Mm -hmm. So you do see a lot of those kinds of miracles. And th they're pretty spectacular because, you know, blindness, you know, <laughs> I mean, we don't have a natural cure for blindness, you know. And, when, you know, there's no reversal of dead tissue you know as my eye doctor himself you know my retinal doctor told me dead is dead it doesn't come back from the dead and so I got the message, mm -hmm. you know, scientific people say dead tissue is not going to be, you know, uh, uh, revitalized into live tissue, right. yet that's precisely what happened in these cases of blindness. So I'd say there are spectacular mm -hmm. miracles, uh, but just, you know, I guess the, the limb ones mm -hmm. uh, are not preferred by Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the only explanation I have, uh, although I, I have heard such miracles occurring in, in uh, uh, you know, 16th and in 15th century, but I've not heard of right. any validated ones in the 20th century. Just before you go to the break, I was thinking about that as well. I mean, uh, the idea, sometimes it seems like everything is done with a certain amount of faith still needs to be involved to appreciate the miracle, mm -hmm. that our Lord doesn't always make it so mm -hmm. black and white that one absolutely just says, oh, well, there still has to be some level of faith. And, and, and I'm trying to remember, and you would know the scriptures where our Lord kind mm -hmm. of, they talked about the fact that they really couldn't perform any works because of the lack of faith of the people there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now that, of course, you know, that one of the unique characteristics of Jesus's miracles is he demands faith mm -hmm. on the part of the person who's requesting it. And faith actually means a trust in him and a trust in the Father who uh, he is representing on this earth, bringing the kingdom of God to this earth. So that trust is, a, a, you, no other miracle worker in the ancient period requires this kind of trust. But when it's there, when we put our trust in Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, the miracle does occur. I, I look at it from the opposite way around too. You know, God is always going to give you an out if you don't want to believe. Mm. So for example, like with uh, Alexis Carroll, right? Alexis Carroll didn't go, wow, this is completely impossible. What does he do? He searches for about 10 years to see if there's any possible natural explanation that he might have overlooked mm. for how a tubercular patient could possibly be healed like that. And of course, giving up on this mm -hmm. and then seeing the blind uh, child restored completely to sight where his tissue goes from dead uh, tissue to alive tissue. Right. I mean, that does right. it. I mean, so he's finally, but he's open at that point to, uh, you know, God. He's already, in fact, right in that in-between period, uh, the, the lady who um, got the cure, who became a, um, she became a sister of charity and lived a very hard and rigorous life. She died in 1937, and I'm convinced she gave Alexis Carroll another mini miracle. Mm. Basically, she, he found a, a, a priest who he could really believe in. And, and of course, it, you know, for whatever reason, this priest had a scientific background. Mm -hmm. He, he, you know, and of course, Alexis Carroll, uh, they got along just great. Mm -hmm. And when they started getting along, he was opened and he began to see, the priest began to say, hey, there's more to life than science, right? There's this, this cosmic right. struggle between darkness and, and light, between good and evil, between God 
and the devil. And of course, you know, Alexis Carroll's finally beginning to allow a kind of a spiritual reality to come into his life, at which point I think, you know, and I don't have a diary of this for sure, but of course, I think his own darkness mm -hmm. becomes so apparent to him that at that juncture, he decides he's going to go ahead and and uh, uh, seek, you know, the church itself. And he does become a, a Catholic. And then, of course, he writes this book, you know, The, the Voyage to Lourdes, which is really his own faith voyage uh, toward the Lord. Very good. We're going to take a break on that note. We've still got a few minutes left in the show. Talking here with Father Robert Spitzer, and I want to mention his wonderful new book. You should check it out, God So Love the World, Clues to Our Transcendent Destiny from the Revelation of Jesus, published by Ignatius Press, available, of course, through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. Some great uh, comments from our friends, Father John McCloskey and Father George Rutler on the back. Again, the book, God So Love the World. Much more ahead right here on Father Spitzer's Universe as we continue. Stay with us. Welcome back to Father Spitzer's Universe. And don't forget all those wonderful books that are available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Mother Angelica's book, of course, Answers Not Promises. And there's a whole litany of uh, Father's books, including The God So Loved the World that we mentioned a little bit earlier, and a whole listing of other books uh, that uh, he's going to mention to us when we go to him, because he's got uh, a couple he thinks are uh, quite relevant to what we're talking about here. And uh, not that that'll be a miracle. It'll be a miracle if we continue this show. So, Father, how are you doing as we, as we continue for our West Coast uh, feed? Let me ask you another question uh, about the sure. whole idea of, of miracles. Uh, have you ever seen yeah. one yourself? Yes, uh, one actually very, very recently. Um, I have a, a very good friend, I, um, I, I, let's just call him Mike, and uh, he was up at the Napa Institute, and um, uh, they had brought a, um, a shawl that had uh, touched and uh, been uh, laid with Our Lady of Guadalupe's picture in Mexico, and uh, these brothers came up and, and brought the shawl up and were actually putting the shawl over people and praying for healing. And Mike had fourth uh, stage uh, cancer, and um, uh, he had not uh, really told anybody except these brothers who came over with the shawl. They placed the shawl on top of him, and of course, they prayed over him. He left the Napa Institute, this was two years ago, and of course, within about a month, he goes to his doctor's uh, checkup expecting, you know, that, well, hopefully the something happened and his cancer went through immediate uh, remediation I mean it literally turned around and and, and the, uh, the the cancerous tumor was reduced practically to nothing and, and of course uh, his doctors were completely uh, uh, stupefied by this turn of events so Mike came back and testified at the Napa Institute uh, the next year uh, to the whole uh, uh, miracle that had taken place the, the previous year and it was really kind of spectacular this guy's a very good friend of mine and so uh, you know thank God he's still alive and, and well and 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 uh, but yeah very very wonderful miracle now how is that how would you say besides the physicality of it how did it impact his life how did it impact your life to see that happen uh, I just think uh, you know you're uh, I mean I I believe honestly there's so many indications of God's presence in my life you know and and so many indications of Jesus's miracles and in, in history and so many indications of miracles already in the Strata Turin I, I I just have to tell you I, I, I this was not a shocker that that it happened what what was the shocker was that it happened to my friend Mike and I was glad that it did and, and I've uh, you know again you know, uh, for him, though, I think it was, uh, you know, a, God is present in my life 
And not only, you know, is God present and, and, and existing, but, but God cares about me mm -hmm. and I must have some kind of mission still left to do that he thought me worthy of getting a, a kind of supernatural intervention on his part to keep me alive to do what I'm doing and to do more of what I'm doing. So I, I would say that that, you know, is, is the effect that it had on him. And it's a, it's a terrific effect and it's the effect that it has on most people. I mean, so many people who are the recipients of miracles actually go on to do truly significant things, including that wonderful lady who, was, who had the tubercular peritonitis on the train who becomes, you know, a sister of charity, and we know the Fatima, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, Sister Lucy. We also, you know, know of of, of Saint Bernadette mm -hmm. at, at Lourdes and so forth. So these are spectacular kinds of things that that do, right. in fact, happen because people are so highly impacted uh, by the miracle in their lives, and they have a, a, an impact on the families mm -hmm. uh, too, and the faith lives of their family. So uh, okay. you know, um, it's it's amazing. Okay, here's a question that kind of ties into that whole idea of mm -hmm. the experience of being healed and also how it affects your Catholic faith. This is Dear Father Spitzer, I'm not a Catholic yet, but I feel that the Lord is calling me to join the Catholic Church. I still haven't done it, and my question is, is it possible that I've been going through different health problems for the past two years because I haven't obeyed the call, and yet the Lord has miraculously healed me twice already from very serious conditions? Thank you, Diana. You know, Diana, I just don't think the Lord works that way. Uh, you know, I, I, I honestly don't think that, um, you know, he causes any kind of pain to happen uh, in, in kind of a retribution uh, for you're not, you know, attending to his call. Now, I, I would say, though, that, you know, those miraculous cures you do have, uh, you know, God's going to leave you free uh, to choose. He's not going to force you to choose. He's not going to push you to choose. He's not going to make you choose to come uh, to the Catholic Church, right, uh, you know, by kind of making a hardship that you could get alleviated uh, if you didn't do that. He just doesn't operate mm -hmm. that way. God always uh, operates in, in, you know, towards freedom. He wants you to freely choose to be with him. So use those great supernatural groundings you've already gotten, these two miraculous cures. I, I would just say, you know, um, you know, there is a call there, you know, that he's waiting for you to move uh, toward, uh, you know, coming into the church. I know there's a great deal of nervousness sometimes about doing this, you know, because, it, you know, it could mean a change with respect to your family or your children or, or something of that nature. But I would just say, boy, it sure feels good when you take the leap and just do it. Find a priest or a parish where you're really at home and just say, I want to be part of this RCIA. I, I, you know, don't do it, you know, in order to get healed or to have an easier life. Do mm -hmm. it because, of course, when God starts touching your life with the Holy Eucharist, when God starts touching your life through the Holy Spirit, you're going to experience a whole new way of life. You're, you're going to be taken into divine providence. You're going to be taken into a kind of divine inspiration. You're going to be able to do more. And, and maybe your health won't improve, but other things will mm -hmm. because you're going to be starting you know, to move out of the darkness into the light. And sometimes, you know, we feel like we're so alone in a cosmic sense, or we're so alienated in a cosmic sense, we're so empty in a cosmic sense. And when we make that move toward the Lord, toward coming into a church, mm -hmm. it's not just psychosomatic. A grace starts coming into your life where you get that emptiness filled in, and that loneliness starts being overcome, and that dark starts being overcome with a sense of comfort and light and the sense of kind of these little panic attacks or the emptiness attacks or these attacks of loneliness start mm -hmm. being overcome as we cooperate with the with the light mm -hmm. and, and so in in a sense then uh, you know you're going to get a spiritual healing and, and and not necessarily another physical healing you might get one mm -hmm. but you might not get one but remember the Lord always operates through freedom mm -hmm. and the gift that you will be given Given at the end of the day is spiritual freedom. You'll be given spiritual healing. You'll be given, uh, you know, a way out of the darkness into the light. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, uh, you know, in, in my own life, you know, that ability to 
just say that prayer, Lord, push back the foreboding, mm -hmm. or Lord, you know, I, <clears throat> I place my trust in you, or, you know, Lord, make some good come from uh, out of whatever harm I might have caused. All these things right. are absolutely, uh, you know, terrific, you know, spiritual blessings that you're going to be given, not to mention divine protection, divine guidance, and divine inspiration. It's a whole new way of life. Right. It's worth it in itself, and you come closer to the God who loves you. Now, next week, we're going to be talking about uh, suffering. Uh, on the program. Let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about the situation in a miracle. I think we've touched on this in other shows, kind of the idea. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, do you pray for a miracle on a regular basis? Is it okay for someone to pray uh -huh. for a miracle that they or someone be healed? Should somebody do that? Yeah. Absolutely, someone should do that. And Jesus did it himself. I mean, here he is in the agony in the garden, right? And, and literally in the middle of contemplating what's about to happen, he turns to his father and he says, Father, let this cup be taken from me. And the cup is the cup of suffering. So let this cup of suffering be taken from me. But if not, if it's not your will, then your will be done. But ultimately, your will be done. So that the key thing is, yes, of course, pray for a miracle. Do I pray for a miracle? Mm -hmm. I absolutely. I, I want my eyes to be healed. But I want my eyes to be healed in a way that's not going to undermine the very good spiritual blessings that God is giving me through this, uh, you know, difficulty with my eyes. But I do. I pray. I say, Lord, if it be your will, just like Jesus in the garden, Lord, if it be your will, then then take this cup of suffering from me. But if not, I want the blessings to continue, the spiritual blessings to continue, a la 2 Corinthians 12, St. Paul's thorn in the flesh, which keeps delivering these spiritual blessings and keeps him from getting proud and, and makes the, 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 the strength of Christ within him more than enough uh, you know, that he needs. Of course, I love my autonomy, mm -hmm. but I love much more the fact that I am now more reliant on Christ and my narcissistic tendencies <laughs> have been seriously tempered mm -hmm. and of course a lot of other really great blessings that have come through this melody including the empathy I have and the humility that I have before other people who really do help me and whose help I really do need so that's my prayer my prayer is really Lord give me this miracle but if th there's still a lot more spiritual blessings you need to give me through this malady then keep giving them to me, I'd prefer to have that than the miracle. And, and of course, if it's time, or if it's ever time, you know, then, oh, I'd appreciate one. There you Even go. if I'd have to have a retinal prosthesis. Yeah. <laughs> to get there. It'd be a miracle of modern science, you never know. So, thank you so much, yeah, Father right. Spitzer. We'll, we'll see you next week when we talk about suffering. I want to invite everybody uh, to check out EW10RC.com to see all the wonderful books that Father Spitzer has. We put them up on the screen there that show new proofs for the existence of God, finding true happiness, satisfying our restless hearts, healing the culture, 10 universal principles. Don't forget about going to the, that's just some of them, Magis Center, MagisCenter.com. Don't forget to send us emails and questions, Twitter, Facebook, so we can uh, answer your questions, especially about suffering. So I'm Doug Keck. Thank you for joining us. Next week, we'll talk about why does God allow suffering? Thank you so much. Till next time.